I would like to uh, welcome uh, all of you to uh, this month's uh, Mitchell Hour. We're extraordinarily pleased to have with us today Brigadier General uh, David Harris, Director of Strategic Plans, Programs, and Requirements at Air Force Special Operations Command. He's a master navigator with more than 2,500 flying hours, including 247 combat hours. General Harris is commanded at the squadron group and wing level and served as the Deputy Director of Operations for Joint Special Operations Command, and he was a Vice Superintendent of the Air Force Academy, which was probably just as challenging, if not more so, than those previous assignments. In an era where non-state actors continue to pose serious threats, Air Force Special Ops provide a spectrum of options to deal with those threats. And on a personal side, as one of the commanders during the early days of the conflict in Afghanistan, I was continually impressed by AFSOC's ability to help us secure incredibly precise and decisive effects, and they continue to do so today. So please join me in welcoming uh, General Harris to the stage. So thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. See you later. Well, good morning. It's great to see so many friends out there today. I was uh, a little intimidated when I saw the list and I saw a whole lot of names out there. And then I walk in here and I'm like, man, it's, it's like old home week catching up with a lot of the folks out there. Well, those of you that do know me know that I'm, I'm fairly laid back. I'm pretty candid. And uh, what I really want to do is just kind of give you a little bit of a sight picture on where AFSOC is going, where we see the uh, near peer competition, highly contested environment, but even more so kind of talk to you a little bit about where we're going with counter VEO. Before I do that, let me just kind of, so you guys understand me, for those of you that don't know me, understand me a little bit better, give you a quick story. So uh, those of you that were in the military in the past, you guys know about these things called unit climate assessments, where you give them to the health of your command and you know they give the little bubble sheet dots that they fill in and that's all important. But what's really important are the words that they put back down and whenever they can write comments and I take those to heart. And I remember flipping through the back of one and in, uh, at the bottom of one of the pages it said, if I had three minutes left on this earth, I'd want to spend it with Colonel Harris. Back when I was really important at that time, I'd want to spend it with Colonel Harris. And I'm like, man, that hit me right here. You made a difference in an airman's life. This is great. Flipped the page and I kept reading and it says, because Colonel Harris would drone on and on and on and make those three minutes feel like a lifetime. <laughs> That, ladies and gentlemen, is the type of presentation that you're going to get here today as I go through the rest of this. All right. So I do appreciate General Deptula. Thanks for having me in here today. I was uh, in the descent coming into Ronald Reagan Airport. And we're going through uh, cloud layer after cloud layer after cloud layer. And uh, it's getting bumpier and windier. And we finally land. We taxi to the north side of the ramp. And I get out. And I you know, get onto the little shuttle bus before it takes you to the terminal. And I remember, I must have said it out loud and I meant it to keep it to myself. And I'm like, man, I'm glad I brought a jacket. This is really freaking cold. And the lady behind me goes, honey, this is nothing. This is great weather for us up here in DC. It was 36 degrees with a strong wind blowing. And I'm thinking, man, I just came from Fort Walton Beach where it was 67 degrees, clear skies, small wind blowing off the water. So I'm going to make a movement that if we do this again, General Deptula, we need to take everybody down to Fort Walton Beach, down to the Gulf Coast, and be able to do this here, or, and actually have somebody really important like General Slife or General Becklin, the AFSOC commander, give you kind of their vision and how they see it stitched together. <laughs> Are we still OCO funded now? Does that work? <laughs> so General Deptula asked me to come down here and talk about how AFSOC contributes to the NDS, where we're going to uh, further our investments, what's required, what do we need to be able to get after this near peer, highly competitive environment. And I think in order to do that, what I'd really like to do is get you into the mindset of what an air commando or an AFSOC airman really thinks about the future. So for those of you that are all former AFSOC alums, I apologize. For those of you that are not, I want to give you a little bit of thinking about how we approach problems and how we see things. So AFSOC really traces our roots back to the earliest days of World War II when we had Lieutenant Colonels Phil Cochran and Johnny Allison. They supported General Wingate and his chindits in the China-Burma-India theater of operations. The European theater and the earliest air commandos used B-24s, L-19s, a whole variety of planes for airdrop and resupply missions for the Office of Strategic Services, which is the forerunner of the CIA, to really support the resistance efforts behind enemy lines. Those forerunners are our special tactics community of today, parachuted in as pathfinders to, to kick off Operation Overlord. 
They were the first Air Commandos to set their traditions of innovation, ingenuity, pathfinding, daring, and courage. So while Air Commandos were born of fire in World War II, we, uh, we've been shaped extensively by one, irregular warfare, and two, great power competition. As you know, modern special operations traces its roots back to the aftermath of Operation Eagle Claw, which was the failed Iranian hostage rescue attempt in 1980. AFSOC was activated as an Air Force Major Command on May 22, 1990, to provide global specialized air power capabilities, such as specialized mobility and precision fires, for US SOCOM and all of its components. And at that time, our primary threat was the so former Soviet Union. So that's about as much of the command brief as I really want to give you. But I really you know, want to highlight a few things out of that. Cochrane and Allison, when they were told by Hap Arnold that, hey, you need to form a small group of elite men to go behind enemy lines to conduct operations to disrupt, defeat, deny enemy operations, you know, they started thinking about this problem set a little bit more, and they realized it wasn't good enough for a pilot just to be a pilot. That pilot had to be part pilot, part maintainer, and I'll poke at him a little bit, and part cook. The maintenance officer really had to be part maintenance officer, part logistician, part security, and also part intel analyst. We had one person taking on many roles when you have such a small footprint, and uh, you'll hear that theme resonate as I talk a little bit more about logistics under attack and expeditionary operations and where we think we might be able to go, and how we can take a little bit of what we've learned from US SOCOM and pair that back into the Air Force when we look at this next problem set that emerges. So over the last 18 years, AFSOC has been at the heart of every fight, really to disrupt, degrade, and defeat uh, Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other global extremist organizations. What we did at that point was we really prioritized investing in the AFSOC we needed at that time because we were all in, and we put a little bit of a low, lower priority, well, we just put a low priority on investing into high-end operations. But because of that, I'll tell you that what we, one of the things we never skimped on was investing in our people. You know, we talk a lot about some of these innovation centers like CyberWorks, and AFWorks and SoftWorks and the whole works enterprise. But if you back that up just a couple steps, it's about people. It's about creating smart people that are agile of thought, quick of mind, to be able to put that type of thinking in place, to be able to look at the enemy a little bit different. I'll tell you one of the groups, just as a side note, and if you'll indulge me here for a minute, that's really kind of led the way for us and who internally we look at as people that have thought differently about the problem set have been our special tactics officers, Crows, Stowe's, uh, PJs, us, and uh, special reconnaissance. But uh, the 24th Special Operations Wing since 9-11 has had one Medal of Honor, 10 Air Force Crosses, and 50 Silver Stars. I, I think they cornered the market on being effective and efficient in that combat or combating uh, violent extremist organizations out there. But uh, we're gonna take what they've done for us and start applying that to the new problem set. So the new problem set, you know, my view is that we're, we're at an inflection point right now. AFSOC, even SOCOM or DOD writ large. You know, the NDS outlines our, our competitors that are out there and the five, the five major threats. You know, in Syria, we face three of those major threats. Russia, violent extremist organizations, and Iran. And our ability to innovate and the things that we have learned from that from that endeavor there. Uh, we, we have a couple things that we've, we've picked out and we wanna kinda continue that thread as we look at a higher end strategy. And one is the importance of developing new partners and strengthening our allies. And we take that to heart because that is the core of every air commando that's out there, building relationships and those relationships matter. There's things that our allies and partners look at when they look at the problem set, they see it a little bit differently and it helps us get a better picture of ourselves to make sure that we're not having any bias to uh, plan to a certain end state that might not be the right end state that we need in there. And if they have weaknesses in areas or areas that we can help them out in, you know, that's the whole part of the exchange into this. And building those partners and allies within certain regions is critical to our efforts as we move forward. The other one that I took away is that I need to be more efficient in our counter VEO operations in order for us to invest in those high-end operations that are out there. And I'll give you a great example. If you take a look at our MQ-9 enterprise that's out there right now, they're doing a lot of work with the amount of caps that we have involved in DOD right now, but it is intensely manpower uh, reliant. 
things like automatic takeoff and landing so I can reduce the number of people it takes for a launch and recovery element. Things like multi-mission command where I can get one pilot flying multiple lines of RPA and then when something happens, he can take over the stick while the other ones are still doing the autonomous look, find and fix mission until we figure out we're gonna come off that target and pick up and go to another one. All of these have an effort for us to be able to move manpower away from one problem set into a higher problem set. So I talked a little about the, uh, the Syria piece of this, but let me just go back and frame it up one more time for you. You know, the chief of staff of the Air Force he talks about a few things, but one of them resonates as a programmer in me pretty, uh, pretty loud and clear. He talks about the threat and how threat drives strategy, how strategy drives a CONOP. CONOPs have requirements. Those requirements have an acquisition strategy embedded with it. Now the NDS kind of points out what our threats are, but that strategy, what is AFSOC's role in that strategy? And I think what you could say is you could probably peanut butter spread that is what, what are all the services, what are all the, our partners and allies piece of that strategy because it's gonna take a holistic fight. And this is where the concept of an all domain command and control network comes into place. Our ability to get after the enemy quickly, our ability to communicate effectively and to make sure that we're reading each other's signals the right way. And I'll, I'll back up one more time. You know, in the war on terror, SOCOM and AFSOC specifically, we had a bias toward action. That's what we wanted to do. I just read you off the Medal of Honor, the 10 Air Force Crosses and 50 Silver Stars. I think in the near peer comp competition, we need a bias toward understanding because one small miscalculation can have catastrophic effects. So being able to understand that all domain command and control, that grid, bringing in the right amounts of information requires an entire teamwork. And I'm gonna harken back to the days of the Chindits there in the China Burma theater. That's what they were poised to do. They were able to kind of read signals, they read the environment, and they were able to kind of flex and be, agil be agile enough to be able to re-vector their efforts to another location quickly, rapidly, and, uh, and be able to capitalize on the initiative. That's something we're gonna consider as we start looking at our strategy. Now another little break from the, uh, the speech here. So I've been doing the uh, plans, programs, requirements piece here for a little over a year. And uh, when I first got into it, I was a little jaded. One is I had a little bit of time in the engine room at the Air Force. And at the engine room, what we did is we all the MAGCOMs came in and they put some money, it was all over top line. And our job was to figure out who the winners, who the losers were, make a brief, present it up to the board, present it up to the council for decision. Always have the unfunded list in my back pocket ready to go for the chief at any given time. But it was pretty easy because we just had to level across there and figure out what capabilities were redundant. Somehow I drew the short straw and ended up at OSD Cape. And that was the forerunner era, the it, PAE was before that, but C CAPE is where I ended up. And it was pretty much the same job. It, I say the same job. All the services came in over budget and we had to sit down with all the services now to make sure that they were fitting within a top line. Being the director of plans and programs at a, at a MAGCOM, I am building the POM. And while I kind of held my head down and went, man, back into the programming business again, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to shape AFSOC for the next five to 10 years. And the first thing I saw, because I was again jaded on all of this, was that AFSOC built a POM, and in a year of execution, FM broke my POM. And then the next POM is we went back and fixed what FM broke, and we'd build the POM again, and then FM would break the POM. All for very good reasons. Because three to five years out, I can't predict the price of fuel. I don't know what the inflation rates are. But all these things absolutely impact where we wanna be. And where is it that we want to be, right? So what we need is that North Star, that guiding element out there that we need to plan to and bridge to and never lose sight and never lose focus of it. And this is where I'll give the Air Force a lot of kudos. By bringing together the Air Force Warfighting Integration Center, AFWIC, and being cross-functional teams out there and kind of giving us that Air Force design, they kept us focused on a problem set. Now, of course, your 88Xs of the world will then cost constrain that back down to what's in reality that we can do, but free thinking your way through that problem about unique capabilities and how we need to approach it differently was incredibly insightful for us. And what I would contend is that for many of us, because of the war on terror, we have let our strategic planning muscle, muscle atrophy. You can iterate on an insurgent eight ways to Sunday, and the end result is always the same. You can't do that in a highly contested environment. It's very different. 
You have to think through it. There's a lot of wargaming. There's a lot of strategy. The things and the biases that you thought you were bringing into the planning scenarios aren't quite the same anymore. The reliance on space, our importance of cyber, information operations, all key elements of where we need to be and where we want to go in the future. So before, uh, before General Slife took over Air Force Special Operations Command, Lieutenant General Webb, who now heads Air Education and Training Command, he, uh, he sat and had a good conversation with Dr. Roper, SAF AQ. And uh, through the course of this discussion, I thought it was very interesting because Dr. Roper really posed four questions to us that we take to heart today when I look at what do we want to invest in into the high end. And he said, hey, Brad, how austere can AFSOC go? How can AFSOC buy time and space for the joint force? How does AFSOC create multiple dilemmas for the enemy? And how do we hide in plain sight? So it takes a lot of thought to be able to put things in there. So the things that we want to invest in, we kind of run it through a litmus test of, of those four questions. And to be honest with you, you're not going to, or we at least don't hit all four of those. So a more realistic piece internal to AFSOC is anything that makes me more lethal, anything that makes me more survivable, and anything that makes me better connected is a key component for what we need to do in the high-end fight. But I'll balance that with counter VEO is not going away. So how much, what does that mutual fund portfolio look like when you're looking at the sector markets of what to invest in? That has to be balanced correctly because again, the bias toward understanding, one small miscalculation can have catastrophic effects down the road. And again, I believe the Air Force is doing a great job at looking into that. Now there's a technology piece to this as well that I'll hearken on, or hearken on to. U.S. Special Operations Command has a joint special operations university out there. They have done some fantastic work when it comes to the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and what they see outside of the uh, human resource aspect, but putting it into war fighting functions and how is it going to be used and how it can enable the war fighter. They also talk a lot about design thinking, and it's a different way of approaching the problem. And when you start bringing partners and allies into this design thinking that I believe was started by the Israelis, I mean, you start seeing the problems and the narratives much differently than we did in the past. So all of that to say that there's a lot of pieces here that are being stitched together. And if that's not complicated enough, the Air Force sees the threats in a certain order. You might have the high-end fight down to the counter VEO. You also have SOCOM that sees the fight very differently. We are heavily invested in counter VEO and then begin working through our high-end fight or the near-peer fight. AFSOC, unfortunately, becomes that Stretch Armstrong doll in the middle, and somehow we have to develop that part of the strategy that's going to balance both of them. And I don't know if that analogy is lost on many of you, but if you rip open the Armstrong doll and you see the green goo that's inside, that's really kind of the, the mechanism that I'm trying to work through right now. And, uh, and I think the best way to describe all of that is to go through some of the portfolio that we have right now and to show you where we've been and how we're moving ahead. So the first example, we took MC-130Es, the Talon 1, MC-130H, and MC-130Ps. We streamlined all of those into the MC-130J to reduce the cost of logistics to common fleet the force to reduce those operating costs. And of course, the J has a lot better performance. Uh, we put some enhancements in there. But I'm going to go back to my three questions, and that was, am I more lethal, more survivable, and how connected am I? So with radio frequency countermeasures and the uh, emphasis we're putting back into that program, that's going to make me more survivable. With advanced TFTA radar to make me more lethal to penetrate, to get in further into an, uh, an enemy objective area, those are the types of things that are enablers that we're looking at as far as making sure that we have sound investment. And the next one is airborne mission networking. And it's not good enough just to be able to talk to our components within SOCOM. I have to be able to talk to the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army on their standard systems as well. And if you've ever seen the matrix diagram or the amount of systems of record that are out there that we need to be able to connect into, it's mind boggling and that alone is an unaffordable project. So where we're going and where the chief is going with joint all domain C2 is absolutely spot on that we are all connected with and the speed in which we can operate in and what that's going to leverage in the future is critical. That combined with space is going to be a decisive effect for us in the future. 
the AC-130s. You could say the same exact uh, example that I've just given you. The AC-130U, the AC-130H, and the AC-130 whiskeys, all fantastic platforms, all being replaced by the AC-130J, common fleeting into one type of platform. Investments into high energy laser and to see what capabilities that's gonna provide for us in the future as far as a standoff weapon. Imp implementing radio frequency countermeasures on that, threat warners, uh, all of these to combined help us become more lethal, more connected, and more survivable. So another interesting one to talk about is our CV-22, one of the first tilt rotor platforms that are out there. The, M the Marines have the MV-22, we have the CV-22, but uh, what this capability provides, if you look at a regular helicopter doing 120 knots from one objective area to another objective area, it's been a workhorse and a stable in the, uh, you know, in the suite of what's out there available for all the forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria right now. When weather starts coming down and you can actually hop in a CV-22 into an Osprey and you can take off vertically, fly IFR profiles above the clouds, get to an objective area, look for a hole, drop through, do an offset infill, they're actually getting people to the target area that we weren't able to get to the target area before. And with their terrain following terrain avoidance radar and some of the systems that they have on board, these types of things I think are the way of the future for us. So you go from 120 knots now to 240 knots of a CV-22. So what's next? What's next may look like something with three pallet positions, uh, lower obser observations or lower observables in there that does about 450 to 500 knots out there to be able to get into places that we haven't seen before. And if our adversary can start targeting every 5,000 foot runway that's out there, every 6,000 foot runway that's out there, can they target every patch of grass that's out there that we could land and then telescope operations in to have decisive effects on a battlefield, creating multiple dilemmas for our enemy? Those are the things that we look at. Again, going back to training our, uh, training our, our maintainers and our pilots, you know, AETC has done some phenomenal work in the, uh, in the areas of augmented reality and, and virtual reality and the training devices and the things that we can apply and put forward with them where you can have one maintenance officer also work fuels and also work security. They can have uh, different parts and components right there. And if you're even not, too, you know, not quite as familiar as you need to be, you can take these small kits into the field with you to be able to do real-time battlefield, uh, battlefield repair onto an aircraft. It's things like that that I think that are in the heart of every special operator that's out there to be able to take a small, lean logistics footprint into places that normally aren't accessible to other commands, be able to have decisive effects and over one period of darkness come back again. The way that we view those expeditionary operations I think are absolutely critical and I think it's something we can bring to the Air Force and start partnering with them. And over the past three months we have been working extensively with ACC, the Air Staff, and bringing other folks in from the uh, Joint Special Operations community to show them what we've done and how we've done it over time. So as we move on, there's uh, one other area that I'd like to, to kind of focus on here, and that is, you know, when you start looking at top line, when you start looking at budget, and we've already talked about AVTOL and all these other areas we'd like to, uh, like to invest in, you know, what we've found over time is that with so SOCOM is more effective as a unit when its components are aligned to its service. When AFSOC is aligned to the Air Force, what we can bring to bear for U.S. SOCOM to operate forward is exponential. When USASOC partners with the Army and what they can use as far as top line budget, what we can make is as service common and then bring that back to US SOCOM is exponential. And you apply that across all the services and now you've got a stronger, bigger, better, more bionic SOCOM to be able to get after some of these problem sets and the threats that we're talking about. The next one is, and you saw it back in the early days when I referenced the uh, you know, parachuting in as pathfinders to kick off Operation Overlord. Our ability to be a pathfinder, the fact that SOCOM has a limited amount of research, development, testing, and evaluation dollars that we can put toward a problem set and partnering that with the Air Force so we can start marrying up capability becomes enormous. And I'll give you one example, and it's palletized munitions. The example is, you know, they've done some testings with C-130s, and the C-130 loads up a HIMARS in the back of it. It flies off and it lands on a beach somewhere in an austere location. The HIMARS comes out the back, it sets up, it finds its target, it acquires it, it shoots. 
it collapses, drives back in, and the plane flies off into another destination that's classified. That's an awesome example. It'd be even better if we could get rid of the beach and the truck in the back and just have the munitions there to be able to do what we need to be able to partner with the Air Force and, uh, and have this type of capability just about resident on any other cargo carrying aircraft that's out there. So by both of us combining together to look at this problem set differently, those are ways that we see that we can influence that high end fight. There's one last piece and it's not the great sexy piece that we all like to talk about. But I think in order for us to be able to take a look at that high-end fight, we need to look at ourselves as AFSOC and reorganize a little bit differently. I think it's fair to say that over time we have swelled to be able to fight the war on terror, and now it might be time to look at a more sustainable ops tempo for us and be able to start investing into that high-end fight. And I think what you'll see is a, a focus on human development, uh, uh, personnel development, investing in our people, but reorganizing within our ranks as well to make sure that we can get past this one to two dwell. You know, we, we talk a little bit about the stress upon all the operators that we have out there. And uh, on average, AFSOC is roughly a one to 2.5 dwell. That, that's not good. You know, we're, our goal is at least to try to get to a 1.3 and you have other units uh, within the big air force at about a 1.5 to 1.6. You do that for about 18 years and people start voting with their feet. We have to be reorganized differently in order to have a sustainable pace and a sustainable ops tempo. And with that, you can start investing into your people uh, smartly and giving them the right training at the right time. So all of that to say that, you know, we need to balance across the spectrum. I need to be more efficient in my counter VEO fight so I can start taking a lot of that portfolio that we have built over the past 18 years and get it a little bit more into the competitive, not into the denied, but competitive environments that are out there. We need to take a look at ourselves and within our ranks and look at how are we projecting forces, how are we force generating. And I would tell you the last part here is there's science and technology initiatives that are out there that are ripe for the picking. And uh, one of the great examples is, you know, we, we in DOD establish a requirement and we give that requirement to industry, and industry builds to that requirement. But if we flip that model on its head, and we say that, you know what, industry is a lot of good work that they've done. They've taken an awful lot of talent that's out there in the marketplace, and they've applied that either to increase their bottom line or whatever. But you know, if you just give them small course corrections and apply a little bit of our research and development dollars, now we might be able to make something that's usable for DOD as well. So you take a lot of that investment uh, the IRAD investment that's coming in from some of our business partners that are out there and, uh, and direct that just even a small direction and we can start being collaborative with each other. We might find that there's more capability that we can onboard into our DOD at a cheaper price point and become more effective down the road in this highly contested environment. So that wraps up my prepared remarks of 30 minutes. But what I'd really like to do is hear a lot from you and your questions and to see what you have for me and things that we might not be thinking of or, or uh, other areas that you're interested in. Go ahead. Now, the Air Force Magazine. I was hoping you could touch on the light attack experiment now that the RFP is out and we know that Hurlburt will get a couple planes. Can you talk about your plans for these and what AFSOC hopes to do with them? So that took all of less than five seconds before the first light attack question came back up. So thank you for the question. So the way that we view light attack is that uh, within AFSOC, we see a mission set one and a mission set two. Mission set one for us really supports our combat aviation advisors. And I believe that RFP has already hit the, hit the streets on it. And uh, it's interesting for us in that manner that when we start working with our partners, when I talk about that acquisition role being flipped on its head, the best thing for us is to look at what our partners have already and then be able to train our pilots using the same platforms that they have. Because the model that we use is that we'll train them in that and it reduces risk to force, quite frankly. You, can tra you could probably train light attack in a variety of different aircraft, but if our partner is flying an AC-208 or an AT-802, you know, in order to reduce the risk to that air crew member, I want to make sure that he is as best trained and best equipped to fly that platform specifically as he goes forward. There's only a few numbers that are really need given the few numbers of combat aviation advisors we have, but uh, we send those pilots and those ST folks and those maintainers and crew members forward to that country. They live and they work with them, and what they try to provide is a PhD understanding of that air-to-ground integration. 
So it's really more than just the plane. It's some of the systems, some of the connectivity, right? Become more lethal, become more survivable, better connected. And we can focus on that connection piece and bring that part of it over to support wherever we can. Now the mission set two, that's more of the large purchase, uh, purchase buy. And I believe the chief has said that, you know, we're still looking back at uh, experimentation and why do we keep saying that? Well, I'll tell you that every time we do something, we tend to learn a little bit more. So just when we thought we're turning right, experimentation may lead us down and they say, nope, keep moving straight ahead because we found something else out different from it. And this team, it, it continues to be a moving target. Uh, can I tell you that there is a need for it in the joint forces, uh, there is a joint need for this, this capability. Uh, I believe General Clark said it in his testimony, but it's the ability to support soft disaggregated troops on the ground where we can be in close proximity and be right there with them. And I'll give you a great example, and it maybe comes from the uh, AFRICOM AOR. And if you want to take a team to go out there and, and uh, conduct operations against violent extremist organizations, I want something that I can land in close proximity in a wadi in a short distance, be able to rearm, refuel, and get right back up over into the fight. That integration and partnership, that habitual relationship that we have with our teammates that are there on the ground, uh, those are the ones that we build trust with. And by using platforms such as that, it just enables us to operate a little bit better. So there's still a couple of different ways to get after it. And quite frankly, I don't think we're there yet. Thanks for the question. Hey, good morning. My name is Steve Burkham from Textron Aviation Defense. You spoke about uh, being able to have better efficiency in your troops. Are you working with bigger Air Force on potential supersets of Air Force specialty codes in order to get at that problem? So we are, and the, uh, so where General Kelly is right now working with the A4, uh, General Barry, uh, they, they've taken a look at it, and I think the first thing out there is to study it, to see how many of these skills that we're already training to are, uh, are parable. You know, in some cases we might not be too far off where it only takes maybe another couple days to be able to give them a core, core skill set in, in fuels versus, you know, doing uh, engine repair, for example. So there could be some things in there that we're trying to match up. And the other part, again, when you look at uh, AETC, and I believe that it's their debt 24 that's looking back into augmented reality and virtual reality, the strides that they're making and how fast these guys are coming aboard, I think is akin to pilot training next, right? You look at how fast these, these, uh, this generation is going through and clipping through some of these models and training evolutions of it, and it's much faster than we thought it was in the past. But that's probably a better answer for AETC because they're the ones pioneering a lot of this stuff. But they are looking at what skill sets would need to be collaborative with each other, where we already have efficiencies, and how do we start capitalizing on them. Good question. Thank you. Kim? Kim DeWitt from Decision Lens. Uh, what would you say is uh, industry partners doing really well in terms of providing capability and strength for AFSOC, and where do you think that we could help focus on more? That's kind of a curveball. That's a good question. The, uh, where are they doing well? There, there's an awful lot of places they're doing well. The uh, one, just the open collaboration. Like I said, when I walked into the room and I look at the crowd and seeing how many of you that I've worked with in the past the fact that we can exchange ideas back and forth, the fact that we can rapidly get after changing requirements, it, you know, I know, that's in, I know that's frustrating for industry, but it's very helpful for us because oftentimes we just need to bounce ideas off of you to say what's really in the realm of possible. And you know, we bounce it off of somebody else to go, hey, what's really in the realm of possible? And sometimes those answers are different. So having iterative conversations to see where each, each everybody's at, it's, uh, that collaborative nature not only has helped, I think, you understand our requirement better, but it's helped us kind of QC, is this really what we want to do? So I think the discussions and the relationship that we have with a lot of our industry partner is, is truly a, a critical asset. What, is, what else is industry doing better? I think the amount of money that they're willing to put in to some of their uh, research and development on behalf of uh, DOD, I mean, I've, I've got to applaud them. It's, it's totally game changing, it's completely helpful because in a days of fiscal austerity when our dollars aren't as high as they need to be but you know the capabilities are out there and it's, and it's needed, um, it, it's really industry partnering with DOD that's helped us out quite a bit. What can they do better? It's, uh, it, you know, I, I think at this point there's, there's times that we still talk past each other 
when, uh, and I don't know if that's service culture, I don't know if that's bias, I don't know if that's uh, maybe failing to clearly articulate the problem set that we're going up against, but uh, there's still issues that are big issues out there that I think are, are, are stumpers for a lot of us. And uh, I'll be honest with you, CV22 may be a good example of that. It's a great example of how we're partnering with Bell Boeing and how they are committed to seeing the success of this program go forward, but it's a hard problem to solve. So uh, there's plenty of other hard problems to solve out there, but uh, we do need to move the ball forward on that one. And I know within the, across the Air Force, there's plenty of other examples they can give you of hard problems that we're working with industry right now. So I don't know if there's a way, uh, or maybe in the future, of almost in the way that you would see a JIAD, if a joint interagency task force come together, but you almost have like an industry task force come together with many components and, and uh, maybe a joint specialties across the board for us to kind of help brainstorm a little bit better about these problems, to look at it a little bit differently. Maybe that could be a helpful uh, way ahead in the future. But thank you. Sure. In terms of your last um, comment about uh, talking past each other, I couldn't agree with you more. And I would say um, oftentimes industry has an, um, an inside looking out mod modality of looking and talking in the jargon and the way we talk. And we, we, we have our own way of thinking about our capabilities and the way we see things. And we often leave the burden on the Air Force or the DOD to interpret what we're saying. And that's, there's just no time for that. So I, I would agree that that's one of our failings or their shortcomings. On the other hand, what I would say on the um, DOD side is um, the people that I see who do really well talking with each other, you know, from industry to um, the military, are the industry folks who do their research and are a very good student of their customers. And what I would suggest to the DOD is a lot of that is, could there be more people that provide that research? Because especially the Department of Defense is extremely easy to research. And then the industry partner starts to realize how they have to translate their capabilities in the domain way the Air Force sees it. But there's, there's a lot of like strat plans, op plans, you know, all those types of documentations, you know what I mean? Those types yep. of things are so easy yes. for you guys to send to partners and just say, if you're willing to study this, then we can have a conversation. No, that's a fair point. And uh, we probably hamstring ourselves when it comes to the classification or the overclassification of some of this stuff. But ensuring that security, that OPSEC piece of it, it's something we're still gonna work through. But uh, I couldn't agree with you more that absolutely, if there's a way of getting those into your hands so you can understand it and look at it from your lens, I, it's a win-win. So thank you, I appreciate it, Kim. Please, Durani. Question is, you talked about we need different type of leadership, you know, to think to the future. What are you doing to work with the academy because the bulk of those are gonna be the leaders? Have you been working with the academy? I know they're trying to find a flexible way to train. Have you gone and talked to them about the way you'd like to see the officers come out in thinking? Okay, so it's been a year and a half since I've been back at the academy talking to those exact students and the faculty and the dean and the commandant about rechanging a little bit of their structure. Remember I, I, I highlighted the fact that AFSOC probably needs to look at ourselves and change how we present forces in the force generation model. We, I think the academy, to some degree, could probably do a little bit better in that regard when it comes to taking a look at what's out there and how do we connect them back into the environment. Here, in my view, and I'm just giving you my view, is the conundrum. The, there's an education base that I fully believe in or an education theory that I fully believe in and the marriage of the arts and sciences coming together is what creates a, a, a pretty capable thinker. And uh, in order to do that, I, I look at the academy and I see the amount of heavy science and the heavy core and the heavy STEM base that they take. But at the same point, they're taking an awful lot of philosophy and, and literature and history and, and some of the other ones that are out there. So I think they're making small changes. Their flexible schedule of calls that's coming on board, the way they're gonna change and modify some of their summer sessions. Heck, just even some of the things that they've done in the Center for Character and Leadership Development right now. Absolutely fantastic. And let me throw one more at you. At the last corona, I believe over top of the chapel that's just getting ready or if it's probably already gone down for, uh, for repairs, they did, a, they did a drone show that was just out of this world. And for these things to be able to swarm and talk to each other and within seconds reconfigure into letters or pictures, all of this coming from the help of our DOD partners as well as from the minds of the cadets themselves internally to be able to work on these tough projects. I think what we're gonna see is a better 
a better, more well-versed, well-rounded cadet coming out of that, but it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. There, there's still more that needs to be done. I will tell you there's even more that needs to be done in the ROTC and, and, uh, and some of the other higher education institutions that are out there as well. So I don't know if that answered your question. Best as I can do, thanks. General Chuck DeCaro, I've got um, uh, several thoughts. Um, I teach at the academy from time to time, and I, I stay in touch with those cadets. I was down at Hurlburt last month to a wedding of one of my former cadets, and the U28 guys. And what I saw was we got a retention problem. Um, what we have is an industrial age pyramidal matrix up or out, without consideration, with consideration of only of skill set as defined by the AFSC, and not the talent they have for engaging and destroying an enemy. You mentioned in your last paragraph, next to the last paragraph in your speech, about industry and talent. Industry knows how to reward talent, and no offense, we don't. As a result, we're getting some really good officers getting thrown out, not thrown out, just fed up and out. If we treated them better without this pyramidal hierarchy, with, with better pay for the talent, not for the FSC, we'd be able to retain this. But we're bleeding out millions of dollars that it costs to train all these guys because we don't understand to how to, you know, to, to care and feeding of talent. So I wonder if you might talk about talent, what we could do to keep it. So there was one part of your question I, I think I, I disagree with slightly, and that would be that, you know, we're, we're maybe not using them to their, to the, to their best effect. I, I would argue that you know, what, what is motivating that individual to come into the Air Force to begin with? And as long as you allow that person to continue to do that job, and you tell that person they're valued, and you show that person that they're valued, they're getting to do the job, uh, you're valuing their opinion, it's both a management and a leadership aspect to it. Now, I'll, I'll grant you that, you know, on a management side, management dealing with policies and processes and, and the like, whereas leadership is inspiring, uh, you know, it's giving vision, it's inspiring hope, those types of things. I, I don't think, and I'm going to paraphrase uh, General Slife if I could, you know, I don't wake up every morning and go, man, I can't wait to get to work because TRICARE takes such good care of me today and, uh, and because I can't wait to earn my pay, right? But I do go to work because I love the people that work around me. My boss gives, my boss empowers me to do my job and allows me to execute and the problem set is unbelievably challenging. And every day it's like a puzzle where the puzzle pieces are there, flipped over, and you just gotta build it back together. So U28s and some of the other uh, platforms that we have out there, I think there's another connection to this. And I talked about it before, and that's the dwell. There's only so many times I can deploy somebody back to the theater. And uh, when I'm looking at officers coming up for a promotion and they've got 22 air medals as, as a captain going to major, I mean, we. We have deployed them nonstop. So I, the I there you go, that's right. So you know, I, I, I think there's a management piece of that in order for us to be able to realign ourselves so, we, so they do have some downtime. And I'll tell you, it even goes back to the previous question that they've had such good combat experience. When do we give them the downtime to be able to reflect on that and think about it, iterate on it, and make it better? We've kind of lost a little bit of our ways of the chin dits where they can constantly kind of be agile of mind, flexible of mind to be able to get after tough problem sets. Sure. Rotating crews of crew chiefs. Yep. So nobody stays on a single bird for any length of time. So you end up not only with weight creep, but CG creep backwards a little at a time but there's nobody there as typical crew chiefs in other parts of the Air Force maintaining their airplane so when you get this double dwell problem what you're asking for is problems 
with aircraft that are not flying the way they were supposed to because nobody there, nobody there consistently over time. I'm not sure if you're aware of that double dwell, but it's there. So you, you brought it up in a different way. Uh, let, let, me, uh, let me go back this way. So a little bit of history from, from the revisionist history, Dave Harris, that I'll give you. And that is, you know, from World War I when we had the big buildup and we invested in the military industrial complexes right behind us. And then all of a sudden at the end of World War I, we dropped down as far as troop strength and end strength. But we had new equipment. You know, we started looking at airplanes, we started looking at submarines. World War II comes along, we take those airplanes, we take those submarines, we iterate and build on it, we ramp up, and then we draw back down again. Now we'll bring you to the war on terror. When we ramped up, we ramped up in contracts, right? So we still have an aging fleet, and, the, and if you want to get rid of things, you get rid of contracts, right? But it's a double problem, because now I'm buffered by a threshold cap of what I have to live under, and I still have a modernization problem, and I still have a people problem. So on your example with the U-28s, U-28s are contract maintenance. But I do, have other, I do have that same problem in other ones where you do have blue suit maintainers going from one platform to another platform to another where there's no consistency of care on the life cycle piece of it. So I, to that, I, I, I agree that, that it's something we definitely need to look at as far as this double, double aspect of it. But for the U-28 specifically, I, I think there's a third aspect of this problem, and that might be the contract, contract piece of it, and then how do we get after it, and how do we modernize the force effectively? And that's been the challenge for the Air Force and for all the other services, frankly, for that long, because contracts were so heavily invested in for GWAT. Sir, good morning. Brian McCarthy from Northrop Grumman. You mentioned... Hey, earlier that you think SOCOM is more successful when the service components are closely aligned with their sister service. Do you anticipate any uh, changes to requirements generation, validation, acquisition strategy to help you align more closely with Mother Air Force when it comes to getting your stuff faster? Yeah, I do. Um, good question. Yes, I, I do see some changes in there. So one of the changes, one great example of it is that mid-tier acquisition or the other transaction authorities, the 804 authorities that we have to be able to get after programs faster. So we're trying to do what we can in the acquisition realm to be able to speed up the process. So, it's, so speed is one thing, but making sure that you have the right requirement is another. And I think there's a way to approach this, and there's, well, there's a few ways to approach it. The way that I think we're approaching it right now, working with the Air Force, is the sooner we can get something in the hands of our operators and allow them to iterate on it together with industry and with DOD, I think that's when we start seeing what's in the realm of the possible because like I said, I think a lot of talent resides in industry and the commercial sector right now. So that combined with what we see as far as a requirement downrange or a requirement for the future, if you combine both of those together and allow that operator and that industry partner to kind of iterate on this together and the 804 transactional authorities allowing us to do it, I, I think that's going to be a win-win. Now with SOCOM, you know they have their own method that they can go back through for acquisition authority, but what we're seeing is a little bit more of, of the Air Force picking up and driving back into these mid-tier acquisition authorities as well. Dr. Roper talks about it often with his 804 authorities and the ability to be able to get after problem sets faster. So yes, good, great question. I appreciate it. Good morning, General. Mark Brewington. Uh, I represent a small company, so uh, my question is to your survivability. So what are the opportunities for not just the larger uh, primes, but the smaller companies to do or access to uh, rd &E type events? So for instance, if we invest 10, 15 percent of our profit back into research and then would like to demonstrate capability, how do we, how do we best engage your organization to do that. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand the question fully. So with small businesses, oftentimes with a smaller top line, I mean, 10, 10 to 15% is a big deal for that company. Um, depending on the problem set that you're going after might not be enough of what we need. So how do we partner, t is the question, how do we partner together the military plus the small business to be able to get after it? So with that, I would tell you that uh, so we do a series of engagements. Our uh, industry liaison officer, our Tylo, works to be able to bring those small businesses in, pitch what it is that you have to make us more lethal or more survivable or better connected across the spectrum, and, uh, and allow that dialogue to happen around the table where we have the division chiefs and we have the A3 and the A4 right there, 
and we can kind of help sharpen the idea a little bit more or at least tell you that, hey, this isn't something we're interested in. There's another piece that's out there that I think is a useful document and it's our gap list. Uh, there's a capability gap list that as we assess all the plans that are out there, what are some of the technologies that we need further investment or where do we see areas that we would like to further develop just to be able to give us a little bit more of a competitive advantage. So it might not quite be a gap, but an area that might be underdeveloped to a small degree. But just having that interface with us and going through our TILO, our industry liaison officer can set those meetings up and we can have that constructive conversation with you. Sure. Lee Hudson, Aviation Week. Last week, Dr. Roper told reporters uh, one of the things that the Air Force has learned from the light attack experiment is the need for an armed overwatch capability for AVSOC. And I was hoping you could expand a little bit on that and what you're not getting from the MQ-9s and other platforms. Yeah, so the armed overwatch piece and, and terming it as armed overwatch is one of the mission sets. It's a variety of mission sets that a lot of platforms provide. Uh, and I will tell you that the MQ-9 is one of them. So uh, in, in the most basics of terms, light attack is not an F-16 and an F-16 is not an MQ-9. They specialize in different areas. They have different weapon suites and capabilities across the spectrum of what they can carry. So for an MQ-9, as you're looking through a soda straw in a vast area over a conflict or a vast area of where something could happen in, uh, in AFRICOMS or SOUTHCOMS area, uh, there might not be quite the right sensors. It may have the loiter time, which is good. Uh, it might not have that span. It's very different looking through that soda straw than being in an F-16 or being in some sort of fighter where you almost have that soft focus. And, uh, and I'll equate it to, and, and you have to follow me on this. I apologize. It's probably a poor analogy here. But um, when you're driving and you're driving down the highway and you have that soft focus where you're kind of looking out into space a little bit more, but you can kind of tell or sense when that car is going to merge over with you versus coming up to a stop sign and you get that tight, narrow focus where you need to start paying attention a little bit more to your distance, your stopping. I would say that's probably the difference between a light attack platform and an MQ-9. You need that wide focus area to be able to support those disaggregated troops on the ground. Otherwise, what you'll see is you have a variety of planes and aircraft in a stack to be able to do different things. And that's kind of what we're trying to get away from. You'll have an MQ-9, you'll have an AC-130, you'll have an F-16, you'll have other platforms all doing independent jobs. I think the future, giving fiscal austerity, might be to be that Swiss Army knife of aircraft that can do multiple things at once. Did that answer your question, by the way? Thank you. Sir. So John, good question. I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to answer all of it, but on the, maybe on the China side, I mean, my, my only experience there, and I'll look at it from an economic point of view, is the buying parity difference between the United States and China and what they're capable of doing and where they can come in in the market-wise to be able to kind of edge us out. And that's why I believe the partners and allies piece of what we're doing is so critical. We want to be the partner of choice when it comes to working with our new partners and strategic allies. That said, on the Russia problem set, um, Again, you look at what they've done with information warfare and how well they are with it right now. Those are areas that I think we need further development in right now. I, again, I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm probably not the best person suited to be able to answer more of a strategic question like that. But, but, uh, but information warfare and the economic side of the buying parity, one of the books that's out there that's, I think, a fantastic book is Unrestricted Warfare on the Chinese side about how much they look at us and marry and parrot what we do in, in, a, in a campaign or a conflict and uh, being able to understand that, internalize, and adjust what we do to give a different demand signal could be very helpful. But again, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to be able to answer that. Sorry, John. Sir. Morning, George Nicholson, the Washington Liaison Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Congressman Rutherford and Congressman Wall, uh, Rutherford's got an amendment in 
for the Defense Authorization Act saying that the Air Force is not effectively supporting a light attack aircraft and that it needs to be moved under and put under the auspices of U.S. SOCOM. If the Air Force doesn't support the program, then it becomes a complete MFP-11 funded asset. Is that, is that correct? Uh, and then the other part of the question is, also last week in uh, one of the, uh, uh, inside the Pentagon, they talked about, Jim Locker said, we've got a problem with soft that we don't have adequate support in the policy area. We need to upgrade the position of the ASD Solik to be an undersecretary. Your position on both of those comments? So in the first one, I would, I would offer that I haven't heard the Air Force come online saying they are not supportive of a light attack program. I, I really do think the devil's probably in the details of the amount of other bills that they have, the other capabilities they want to onboard. But I will tell you, at any given time, the, the, the Air Force's commitment to the ground force is alive and well. It's, it's healthy, and they want to support. Uh, to the extent that they can support, I, I can't answer the question. On the, on the second one, as far as the upgrading uh, Solik to a, you said an undersecretary position? The equivalent to current undersecretary Correct. I, I would probably have to look into that one a little bit more to understand really what the second and third order effects are of being an under versus an assistant secretary and what implications, second and third order implications that would have for SOCOM, whether it's the budget, whether it's oversight of authorities, and what would be pulled up to that level. So. Um, Again, probably something I'm not qualified to answer on. I apologize. Good question, though. Sir? Well, we've come to the end of our time. And uh, on the behalf of everyone here, General Harris, I want to uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, tour de force of uh, Air Force Special Operations Command, uh, as well as uh, fielding uh, the uh, questions so adroitly. Uh, and uh, so at the very beginning of this, you talked about Cochrane and Allison. Uh, and so we have a little gift for you here called Project 9, the birth of the air commandos in World War II. Sometimes it's worthwhile to take a bit of time to actually go back and look at our history to see what the conditions were that allowed men like this uh, to make such incredible progress and, and be as innovative as they are. And if there's anyone who follows in their footsteps and is an innovator to perhaps do what they did as it applies to the future, it will be you. So thanks very much for being here with us today. I appreciate the time. Thanks again. This is great. Thank you all. Have a great aerospace power kind of day.